Hi. Um, so my name is Kelly. I'm a user experience designer. And this is Richard, who's a front-end developer. And we're here today to talk about minimizing complexity when it comes to design systems, in particular, minimizing code complexity. This is going to be a bit of a nerdy talk, this one. Uh, <laughs> just wanted to reference someone that really inspired me today. And uh, yeah. What, my dream, what I'm really hoping, is that throughout the day, I'm going to move into these screens. <laughs> so take a moment. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So uh, as it was said in the intro, uh, we're building a design system for Bernardo's. So you may know of Bernardo's as, oh, they're those people that have like all the charity shops around. Um, but they don't just do that. They are, as it was said, the largest children's charity in the UK. And they provide a wide range of children's services, um, things in areas like fostering and adoption, for example. They also provide uh, a lot of digital services, and they're in the process of building a lot more. So in order to, to support those services, uh, we're building a design system. And what's kind of unique to this compared to other design systems, potentially, is that children and young people are part of the audience and part of the users which is really exciting for us. Um, and they've been involved in the process, which has been really, really cool. Uh, so we started in January. Uh, we're a team of two, so it's just the two of us, mostly. Uh, and we've also been really lucky because we've had amazing support from the team in which we were uh, hiding, the digital team in Bernardo's. And we're also really lucky because it was kind of a starting from scratch project or like a greenfield type project. So there wasn't any need to sort of do a, a large audit um, like other people might have to do and kind of figure out how to sort things out. We were able to really start from the ground up, which was really, really nice to do. Cool. So uh, when Kelly and I uh, first started working on the design system, we, we attended quite a lot of meetups and talks. Uh, and we heard uh, phrases like this or variants on it all the time. Uh, another one was about how designers and developers uh, need to work together to make the design system successful. Uh, and another one which I personally like, and that's uh, design systems are about bridging the gap between design and development. Now, Bernardo's builds the majority of its digital services on the web and not for native apps. So, uh, Kelly and I are going to talk about the journey we went through when we asked ourselves the question, how can we bridge this gap when we build stuff for the web? And like I said, it was really good that it was just a team of two. So it was kind of we could make the decision of how we wanted to do this. Um, and based on our, both of our experience, we've both been working for about 12 years doing this. Um, and what you can probably relate to is that it's quite common for designers and developers to work in very siloed teams, very separate teams, um, for designers to create a lot of uh, design artifacts and files and polish things and make it look really, really beautiful and then chuck it over the fence to some developers. Maybe they're not even necessarily in the same office. Who knows? And those developers have to then translate all of those uh, designs and what the uh, vision was supposed to be for those. And there can be a lot of back and forth. Um, not designers and developers can't necessarily understand each other or speak the same language. So there's a lot of uh, barriers there. Um, and equally, uh, as, well as, as well as that being an inefficient process, um, it can also create kind of false concepts. So um, designers can kind of create sort of, for example, three set sizes of something. So mobile, tablet, and desktop. Um, and that doesn't really exist. It's not a thing. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we knew this. We acknowledged this. Um, we had the ability to just work in whatever way we wanted, which was really, really exciting. Um, so, because we didn't want to waste time, effort, and resources, we uh, decided from the get-go that we weren't going to use design tools. We weren't going to create design artifacts. So we were going to pair, which is what we did. Uh, we focus on one thing, which is the end product, and that's for experimenting, polishing things, um, maybe making something small and throwing it away, but all of it is done in code, and it's the final product, and that's it. Um, it kind of worked for us because of our skill sets individually. I don't know if it would necessarily work for everyone, but um, it just happened to work really well for us because I'm a UX designer that has um, knowledge in code, so always have been interested in code. 
Um, and this was the first time I was able to work in production ready code, which was really exciting. I used to just put BRs whenever I wanted some space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and inline styling, which, you know, front-end developers love. Um, so, yeah, I kind of had that uh, understanding and have been able to learn a lot about uh, React components and, and kind of crafting proper code. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's how it worked for us. And also, Rich has got really strong knowledge in design and, and really good kind of content writing skills. So it's, if, we, if we had a Venn diagram, which we should have had because it's mandatory for one of these talks, we, we needed a Venn diagram. But uh, we have a lot of crossover of skill. Uh, and then we can also bring, uh, bring extra. So we designed in the browser. We, um, <laughs> we share driving. So sometimes I'm driving, sometimes Rich is driving. Um, and we also code in the open. So we have uh, just an open GitHub repo, which is, like I said, the final product and the only thing that we focus on and work on. Um, and in order to do this, what we kind of found when we were working together is that we've started to communicate in a kind of shared language. Uh, so what we found was that the best shared language when pairing in a browser was a relative language. Uh, so what we found was that we weren't talking in absolute terms. We weren't saying things like, uh, we, let's make this space 15 pixels, or let's change this color to this hex value. The conversations we were having were really relative. They were like, uh, this space feels a little bit too tight, can we make it a little bit bigger? Or this color is... Uh, too dark, and we de-emphasize it by making it a little bit lighter. So what we needed, and what we realized we needed, was a simple set of rules that would allow us to quickly translate those uh, relative language conversations into the browser. So we created three rules to allow us to do that. So we're going to go through those today. So the first rule is around color. So we have uh, some set brand colors, and to extend the color palette, we created a simple rule which is that you can add white or add black in 10% increments to extend the color palette, and that's it. <clears throat> so you can see on the left-hand side here, the uh, brand colors, is just, there's just eight colors, which means that in code you have eight hex colors which are then represented, and that's what you've got. And then on the right-hand side, you can see as well that it doesn't restrict creativity. This is really interesting what Gina said at the beginning, is that there is that fear that design systems can restrict creativity. And what we really wanted to do here with these rules is we wanted to create rules that really allow a lot of flexibility within them. So on the right-hand side, you can see that the drop shadow of this button is a, like a 40% uh, shade of the green. And then there's like an inset on the error input, which is a tint of the red. So it's using those colors. And at the bottom, you can see how simple that implementation is in code. So you just have your brand color, and then you have the shade value at the end. And it means that that conversation and that communication that we have between each other is so simple. So if I was to say, hey, Rich, like, I think that the drop shadow isn't really uh, strong enough. There's not enough differentiation between the button and the shadow. It needs to be darker. It's a one character change. We don't have to have a conversation about how much darker. We've created the rule. It goes from 40% to 50%, and it works. Cool, yeah. and this also ties into the previous talk about design tokens. Uh, and this allows us to have like a smaller set of design tokens and then a rule that allows us to extend it. And you'll see that occur again on the next one, which is the, the second rule we have is for layout. Now, I love this rule because it means I get to use my favorite unit on the web, which is the REM. Uh, it's a fantastic unit, allows you to do all sorts of powerful stuff. Um, and we say that we should, the rule itself is about using increments of four pixels for spacing line heights and things like that. And so if you're familiar with the REM unit, you'll know that uh, four pixels is about equivalent to a quarter of a REM. So what we're saying is use a quarter of a REM increments for kind of all spacing. So for an example, this is the quote component from the design system. And a conversation we typically have when we're building out this component or we're making an adaptation to it is like, okay, well, it looks good, but the the name is a little bit close to the quote text. Can we increase that space a little bit? So we look at the code and we see currently it's got a margin top of one rem. So maybe we bump it up to 1.5 rem, which is two increments up. And so, like I said about the design tokens, this uh, allows us to avoid the need for uh, variables like, like medium and then large and then larger and largest. You get into a system where you have to memorize the naming conventions for your variables. And we're replacing that with uh, just a very simple rule you, you need to remember, that's use four pixels. And the last rule we have is about typography. So we start with a base of 16 because that worked for us uh, for paragraph text. 
um, and then all we simply do is times that by 1.125 to get the next size up. It's a bit like musical scales. Um, it actually has a name. I think this one's called Major Second, but it's putting typography on a scale rather than a designer kind of coming up with um, arbitrary sort of H1, H2s and things like that that don't necessarily relate because the problem with that is it's kind of a finite scale then and if you need to go bigger then you've got to have a class which is extra, extra large or a, a smaller footer thing that's smaller than a paragraph that's extra, extra small and it kind of, it'll, it tends to break all the time. Um, what's great about this rule is that it's an infinite scale um, and it kind of relates to itself and it grows exponentially. So using this formula, uh, we then converted, so we used the 1.125 formula and converted that into REMS. We then put that into the file you can see here. We call these type slots so we can communicate. Um, and then you can see the kind of mathematical uh, formula underneath each one of these here. So this one is uh, times eight, so it's 16. Uh, doing that eight times to get that amount. Um, and again, it just really helps with the conversation between us. So if we have, uh, say, the heading, and uh, I'm looking at the design, I'm saying, that, look, the heading needs to be bigger. It's, again, not coming up with, oh, how are we going to do that? How much bigger? It's just me going, hey, Rich, can you bump that up a slot? Or the title's too big. Hey, Rich, can you bump that down a slot? It's already defined. There's a rule in place, but there's flexi flexibility within it. Okay, so by creating these three rules, uh, one for color, one for spacing, and one for type size, we were easily able to translate our relative language conversations into the browser. And this in turn allowed us to quickly design in the browser while also keeping the code nice and simple. And that was kind of what we set out to do and we achieved with these three simple rules. But even though the rules are simple and then the code is simple, it's still easy to make mistakes. But that's OK, because uh, there's tools out there that can catch those mistakes for us. And the tool that we used for Bernardo's design system was called Stylelint. Mm -hmm. So using Stylelint, uh, Rich wrote plugins to enforce the rules. And you can see them here, so these three here. So the first one uh, enforces the 10% increments for color. Uh, the second one enforces the multiples of four, or quarter of a rem for spacing. And the third one enforces the use of type slots. And the great thing about these plugins is um, it catches us out as well. If we make a mistake, we get that instant feedback like you do with the linter anyway. So you don't have to wait for a code review or a pull request to find out you've done something wrong. It's just straight away. Um, it also really helps with teams that are taking on the design system to learn the, learn the system, learn the rules, and again, to just really enforce that consistency, but with ease. It's kind of using tools not to restrict, but just to really keep keep tabs on, on what we're doing. Um, so for example, if you were to do at the top, you know, a 13% uh, percent tint when you were doing your code, it would catch it out because of these plugins. Cool. Uh, that ties back into the uh, design to token uh, talk before about how we still have design tokens for like consistency of the stuff, but then we're replacing the larger token set with a rule. But the important thing is that rule is enforceable, so it still has that same control over it. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, the other way that we try to minimize complexity is by enforcing the design system principles. So we all know that uh, CSS can quickly get out of control, uh, regardless of whether you're using CSS or SAS or some uh, CSS ingest solution. So before we wrote any styling code, we used this as our styling configuration. Now, it's basically saying allow nothing. It's saying don't allow any selectors, don't allow any properties, don't allow any units or at rules. And once we had established that baseline, we were able to, um, well, we carefully allowed uh, things that would align to our principles. So for example, the first thing we allowed here was uh, min width. And by only allowing that, it enforces our principle of starting small, which kind of in the developing context, that might be mobile first. Now this is great because uh, like, regardless of what styles um, solution you're using, if half of your components are using min width, and the other half are using max width, you're in for a bad time. Uh, and then another example here of our principles, and it's my favorite REM unit again. Uh, so we have this principle of uh, embracing digital, which could be also construed as like embracing the medium. And so we're saying use REMs, which are a unit you can only find on, on in the browser. I don't think you can find them in design tools. And this is great again, because we can do some really powerful things with REM units, <coughs> which are difficult to do in design tools, like, for example, we proportionally scale up the entire design system interface uh, to best fill up the kind of viewport, 
And we could do that with just a few lines of code with REMS. So it's, it's powerful. So Lint is for the win, um, or Lint for the win. So we, using this Lint has really helped Kelly I when uh, we were actually working on the science system itself because it, it caught us when we were accidentally breaking the rules that we knew well. But from our perspective, when we're building the design system, the most important thing, uh, by whitelisting stuff, we, it forced us to reason about every bit of uh, every property and every at rule that we added to the system. And it, it asked us and it forced us to ask ourselves, uh, what is the benefit to the user of allowing this thing? Uh, is it worth the added complexity? Uh, so it's been good for us, but it's also been good for the teams who are building services uh, using the design system. So we publish our configuration file for, the, um, for those teams to consume. And that's really helped because like, these, this way of working is quite different and quite unusual for uh, teams who are more used to working in silo teams. And so I did pairing together. Uh, and this has allowed them to get more up to speed because they get into the editor, the code and way they're working, and they're getting instant feedback from there. Oh, actually, I've used uh, something that's not aligning to our rules or not aligning to the principles. And so that's been great for them to learn it but it's also been great for them to adopt this way of working. So just to sum up, uh, magic happens when designers and developers work closely together. I really, really encourage it. I think everyone should do it or at least try it once. Um, I think part of that to make that work is really designers like get into code, like please, please understand code. You don't necessarily have to be able to be a developer. It's not to that extent but just really try to understand the medium. And working with developers also, um, it's just about realizing that developers are creative people as well and that like designers aren't this like, we're not imbued with some kind of like amazing creativity gene. It's like different kinds of creativity, which again, Gina talked about at the beginning. And that's what's really helped with us is that pairing and just working together all the time has meant that you know, I come from like that user experience, UX side, and then Rich can just throw in equally really, really great solutions to things. Um, so yeah, to, in order to make that work, get out of the silos and get, get into code. Um, so yeah, just to sum up, pairing is great, collaborating is great, designing in the browser has been great, it's really efficient, we don't have any wastage, we have no design artifacts or design tools. Again, may not necessarily work for everyone. It worked for us starting small um, and uh, yeah, being able to have the buy-in and just start with something from scratch. Um, and also communicating in a relative language really worked. So getting out of uh, sort of absolute figures and almost like print-centric uh, language, which is a bit left over, I think. So um, looking at kind of you know 12 column grids and stuff and maybe thinking about the sense of just starting on mobile and then just seeing how much you can get that to work and then having that conversation, what you need to add in order to make it work as the viewport grows, it's not three set sizes. Really interesting way of working, interesting way of thinking. It saved us a lot of time. It's really kept the code simple because it's helped to justify any code complexity. Is this, is this complexity actually worth the user's benefit? Is it a user benefit? Or is it just a designer going, oh, I want this here because that looks pretty. It's that, it's again, like really having that conversation about, actually, no, I'm happy for you to let that go. That's too complex. And me kind of seeing that, you get a lot more visibility about what's going on under the hood, which again, silo teams, you don't see that complexity happening. And I think, again, for designers, really start taking responsibility for longe longevity of code, especially if you're doing platforms. You want your code to be simple because you want it to last. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs>